Hey everyone, I'm in the car with my wife coming back from Chicago, heading out to the College of DuPage area, and I uh, thought I would take this opportunity to record a sequel uh, to the video that I made last night about church and church history. Uh, if you haven't watched that video yet, I'd highly recommend you do so because I'm going to presuppose um, that you have. So at the end of the first video, uh, where, where did we, we leave off? Well, we talked about uh, the three largest uh, groups within Christianity, the three largest parts of the Christian church in terms of numbers, the Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox, and the Protestants. So for each of those three, we talked about when they arose and where they arose, and we talked a bit about their geographical distribution, right? Actually, just to add to that really quickly, we, you know, I, I talked a little bit about this idea of Catholics being Western and Eastern Orthodox being Eastern, and there's a lot of truth to that, but it's a little more complicated than that. Um, one thing I, I should have emphasized is actually you can find Catholics around the world today. Um, when we were talking about Protestantism in that video, I mentioned that Protestantism arises in the early 1500s in Western Europe, but obviously Protestantism is around the world today. Uh, for example, one country that actually has quite a few Protestants in it is South Korea. It's a lot of Christians in South Korea, and I, I think basically all of them are Protestant, and in particular, there's a lot of Presbyterians. Okay. So um, we talked a bit about, you know, church history with um, Jesus and the apostles and the Roman Empire and the Byzantines and um, the Fourth Crusade and, you know, the early 1200s Fourth Crusade where, you know, this large group of Christians split and we get our Catholics and Orthodox and then we get our Protestants, right? Um, I'd like to say, so what, what, I'd like to say more about this. And what do I want to do in this video? I want to talk a bit about um, this issue I addressed at the end of the last video. So if we're going to say that Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and Protestants are all Christians, which we do, why? Well, they have to share some stuff in common. Great. What is it? And if we're going to talk about them as distinct groups, what do they not share in common? One thing um, we could do too is talk a little bit about Orthodox that don't fall under the Eastern Orthodox heading. And I want to draw a big distinction within Protestantism between what I call Nicene Protestants and non-Nicene Protestants. I alluded to that briefly in the last video, but I, I didn't really, uh, I didn't really explain it. Actually, I also talked a bit about heretics. I had to put that in quotes and I explained why in the last video, but I didn't really say much about, you know, what are these heretics believe, all right? And maybe actually we could start with that. Maybe we could start with that. You know, who are these quote unquote heretics, right? And, and, and actually, maybe I'll say again briefly, why, why, am, I, why am I putting this in, in scare quotes? As, as, I, as I confessed in the last video, uh, I myself am a Christian. I'm an Eastern Orthodox Christian. And so actually I agree with our, you know, church's narrative about the identity of these heretics. But the, again, this is College of DuPage. This College of DuPage is a secular institution. It's not a religious institution. The professors shouldn't be picking sides. And I, I mention all of this because actually it's kind of difficult to, to come up with really neutral terminology to talk about this. And we, we don't have perfect choices here. I mean, a lot of times we're forced to use terms that aren't really ideal. I mean, again, what, what neutral term do we have to refer to the Old Testament? We don't. Old Testament's not really neutral. Hebrew Bible isn't totally accurate. Um, Jewish Bible, well, it's also scripture for Christians. So uh, sometimes, you know, we, we just have to do the best with what we've got. Um, let, let's delve a little more into this, uh, this idea of the heretics. Let, let's talk about the, the contest between the, the heretics, or we might call them the heterodox, people who believe wrongly, the heterodox, versus the orthodox, orthodox small o. So we have heterodox, 
the people who think wrongly and the orthodox small o, the people who think rightly. Now, of course, each group thinks that it is the orthodox and the other folks are the heterodox. You may have heard, you know, history is written by the victors. It's pretty much true. So here, when we're, when we're saying that a certain group are heretics or heterodox, and another group are orthodox or non-heretics, I mean, that's obviously from the perspective of, well, the people who won. Well, who, who was it that won here? I hope this isn't complicated, by the way. You can rewind this stuff and rewatch it, right? So who who is it that won? It, 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 uh, this makes it a little more complicated before we get into this. One thing that makes things really complicated for us, right, is that we have this word orthodox small o and orthodox big o. Well, who who is orthodox little o and what does that mean? And who's orthodox big o and what does that mean? We're, we're going to get into, we've already talked a little bit about orthodox big o, We'll get into that more later. But for us, when it comes to Christianity, Orthodox small o are the Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox, and a lot, not quite all of the Protestants, right? Well, how are we defining Orthodox here? We're defining it in terms of believing the right things. Well, what are the right things? Well, mostly it comes down to the doctrine of the Trinity and the incarnation and related to that the two natures of Christ. Again, there's this fancy Greek word for that, duophysitism. Duo from two, physitism from fusis or nature, which is where our word physics comes from, right? Duophysitism, two natures of Christ, incarnation. The idea here is that Jesus is God and man. God and man, God and man. He's God the Son and the Son of God. Jesus is this God-man, fully God, fully man. Going along with that, the idea of the Trinity. There's one God in three eternally distinct persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The idea here is that Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they are three eternally distinct persons. Like, not distinct 2,000 years ago or 13.67 billion years ago at the Big Bang. From all eternity, this one God has been somehow divided into three persons, right? The doctrine of the Trinity and the two natures of Christ. And you can actually pull these apart from one another. But for the orthodox small o, these things go together. The Trinity and the incarnation. The Trinity and the two natures of Christ. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all one God, the God of the Jews, the God of Israel. And one of these persons of the Trinity, the Son, became man in Jesus of Nazareth while remaining God was God-man. Trinity and incarnation. By the way, if you know some Spanish, you might know the word for meat. Um, maybe it's also the word for flesh in Spanish is carne, incarnation. It's like in meeting or in fleshing, taking on flesh, right? Carne is also a word in um, Latin. This is where our term incarnation comes from, right? So who believes these doctrines, the Trinity and the incarnation? The Roman Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox, in most but not all Protestants. That's who believes them, right? And for our purposes, we'll refer to the people that believe those doctrines, the Trinity and the two natures of Christ, we'll refer to them as the Orthodox small o, the Orthodox small o. So again, the Orthodox small o are the Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox, and most but not all Protestants, and they believe the Trinity and the Incarnation, the Trinity and the two natures of Christ. Well, how old are these ideas? Who are the heretics then? Who are the heterodox? And how old are the Orthodox small o? How old are the... Um, how old are these ideas of the Trinity and the two natures of Christ, the Trinity and the Incarnation? Well, for a while, for a while, um, scholars thought that uh, this idea of the Trinity and the two natures of Christ it probably took a little while after the death of Jesus to develop. Uh, if you go back a couple of decades, you could find a lot of scholars teaching it. And actually, what a, what a lot of a lot of scholars had this view. Now, actually, I should interrupt this quickly. Um, 
many Christians have said, well, the, 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 the Bible clearly teaches the Trinity and the two natures of Christ. The Bible clearly teaches it. And uh, you can find it in the Gospels and the letters of Paul. And, 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 and a lot of early Christians believed it too because they just read it in the New Testament. So again, if you talk to a lot of Christians, they would say, how old is the Trinity and the two natures of Christ? They would say, well, you can find like prophecies of it in the Old Testament. It's clearly in the New Testament and a lot of, or, you know, the apostle, Jesus taught it, the apostles taught it, a lot of early Christians taught it. It's in the New Testament. There it is. It goes back to the beginning. A couple of decades ago, actually over a hundred years ago, you started to have some scholars question it. A lot of these non-Christian scholars, but some Christian, and they started to question it. And some actually came up with this idea that you had this kind of linear development here and that maybe the New Testament doesn't teach the Trinity or the Incarnation and no really Christians believed it. And then some Christians started, you know, believing, you know, um, you know, you know, had had certain views and other Christians had certain views and other Christians had certain views. And you end up having this sort of development where at the beginning there is no belief in the Trinity or the two natures of Christ. And at the end, um, and maybe it takes a couple of centuries, you get this idea of uh, the Trinity and the two natures of Christ, that, it, that, that it's not in the New Testament and, uh, and, no, and no early Christian has it and it takes time to develop. I would say now, and I could give you lots of sources on this, um, I don't think there's really many atheist scholars who believe this anymore. Um, it's true, when you turn to the New Testament, it's, there's actually some debate about, you know, which texts of the New Testament, if any, teach something like the Trinity or the, or the, the incarnation of two natures of Christ. I think even a lot of atheist scholars now would agree there's at least some books in the New Testament that seem to pretty clearly teach that Jesus is God and Jesus is man. And you find a number of uh, books in the New Testament that are pretty clear. There's one, I mean, the whole New Testament is clear. There's one God. And uh, there's quite a few books in the New Testament that um, they clearly believe in the Father. They clearly seem to believe that Jesus is divine. And they clearly believe that the Holy Spirit is divine. And they, at the same time, seem to recognize there's some distinction between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think you can actually make a pretty decent case that there's a number of books in the New Testament that actually do envision something like the Trinity and that there are certainly some books in the New Testament, I think, that are pretty clearly believe that Jesus is God and a human being, right? Absolutely all of them. Yeah, I don't know if I quite go that go that far. If you're really interested in that, send me an email. It could be a little bit complicated, right? Um, but I, and again, I think you have even a lot of atheist scholars saying this today. That, you know, they might say that some books of the New Testament um, like, for example, the Gospel of Luke maybe doesn't clearly envision Jesus as God, but that the Gospel of John clearly does. And I think more and more scholars are even coming around to saying that Mark does and Matthew, um, Paul maybe has something like that idea. So it, it might not all be spelled out exactly like we would spell it out today, but it's, you know... Um, <sighs> It is there, you know, pretty, or at least it's pretty close to being there in at least a number of these texts. A lot of scholars also would say that we have pretty strong evidence today that a lot of early Christians, even the earliest Christians, did believe in these doctrines, that belief in the Trinity and the Incarnation, um, it goes back to the earliest Christians. So, um, again, I myself, I'm not sure I would say that every book in the New Testament um, teaches it. I'm personally, I'm not sure that Luke actually does envision Jesus as being God, but I'm pretty sure John does and Mark does and maybe Matthew and I think Paul. So we have some basis for the Trinity and the two natures of Christ in the New Testament. And we know that a lot of early Christians now believed it. So in that sense, it does basically go back to the beginning of the church. Um, so if orthodoxy small o is Trinity and two natures of Christ, well, I think you can actually make a pretty good case that it's 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 in the New Testament. Um, maybe not perfectly consistently, but there it is. And that you have a lot of early Christians believing it. Well, if that's the case, then who are the heterodox and who are the heretics? Well, they're people who don't believe that. They don't believe the Trinity and they don't believe the two natures of Christ. Uh, well, well, what do they believe then? Well, here's the interesting thing. 
It turns out that in the early church, in the very beginnings of the church, there are a lot of debates about this Jesus guy. There's a lot of debates about this Jesus guy. And I think this is where you see one thing that is so distinctive about Christianity is all of these Christians are really, really interested in Jesus and they are debating about him endlessly. And what are they debating about him? Well, they're not really debating what's his favorite food or his favorite color. Um, by the way, the gospels don't tell us anything like that. Um, what they're really debating, and we call these the Christological debates. This is Christology. Uh, Christology is, is the study of the nature of Jesus. The, the Christological debates are the debates over the nature of Jesus. What they're, what they're largely debating is, is Jesus God, human, both, or neither, right? And so, again, if we go back to the incarnation, you say Jesus is God and human, both. There were people in the early church who said, he's just God, he's not even human. Um, some of these people seem to have thought that Jesus was like a hologram that God projected from heaven. There were other people on the other side who thought he's purely human. There were other people who said he's not really God or human. He's like this super angel. Like, like the he's this super angel. The first angel that God made, the first thing that God made was Jesus, Right? And so it's really interesting. You go back like 1900 years and you have all these Christological debates, these debates about Jesus. And again, they're, they're debating, is he God, man, both, neither, what? Well, what do these people agree on anything? Do they agree on anything about Jesus? Yeah, they agree on a lot. They agree on a lot about Jesus. What do they agree on about him? Well, they... They all agree he was, you know, there was a person or a hologram, right? There is some, some like, some appearance, you know, that went by the name Jesus of Nazareth that, you know, walked around like eating pizza, or at least people thought he was eating pizza. You know, like he ate, he, he slept, or at least seemed to. Um, okay, what else? Well, everybody agreed he called these 12 apostles. Everybody agreed that Mary was his mama. Everybody agreed that Joseph was his father or his adoptive father. What else did they agree on about Jesus? They all agreed that he taught various things. They all agreed that he healed people. Um, this is actually one thing about Jesus is really, really striking. Jesus is a Jew, right? The gospels talk about Jesus healing people left and right. It's like every time Jesus left his house, and like, you know, walk down to the corner store. He cured people of blindness and deafness and um, rose, you know, raised people from the dead and all, and all other sorts of things like this, cast demons out of people. Do we have stories like this about figures in the Old Testament? There are some prophets in the Old Testament that do these things, but they don't do these things uh, with anything like the frequency that Jesus does them. Um, these miracles in the Old Testament seem to be pretty few and far between. And uh, when they happen, the text often seems to emphasize it's really God the Father doing these things through the prophet. The prophet's not doing it on their own, they're doing it through God. And the Gospels, Jesus has just presented as like doing this stuff on his own, left and right, left and right, left and right. When you look at texts in rabbinic Judaism, like the Talmud, do you see any of the rabbis perform miracles? Very few rabbis perform miracles, and, they, and, they, and they're few and far between. Jesus is really kind of a, an, a, a sort of an odd duck. He's kind of a strange figure that in this Jewish tradition, that he's like the one guy who's doing these miracles left and right, left and right, left and right. And it seems that even a lot of people who did not like Jesus actually accused him of performing these miracles. They actually, they, how could they accuse him of? Well, they said it's like evidence that he's like a magician or something like that, or he's in league with the devil. Like one, one thing that a lot of early folks, whether they like Jesus or not, seem to agree on about him is he's, he's doing these healings and these exorcisms and all of that. And that's one thing that these early followers of Jesus, whether they believe in the Trinity or not, the incarnation or not, they believe Jesus is doing these miracles. And it's not just that they think he's doing these miracles. They think he's like the savior of the world. They think he dies on this cross and he rises from the dead. And somehow by doing this, Jesus like brings salvation to humanity. Now there's a lot of questions actually that we should 
ask about that? Like, like, what is that? What does that mean? You know, um, you know, by the way, in Judaism, can you repent for your sins? Of course you can. Does God extend you forgiveness for sins in Judaism? Of course God does. There's actually really interesting rich theology about this in Judaism. It's it's fairly complicated in some ways. There's different types of, different types of forgiveness, but yeah, of course if you're Jewish, you could get forgiveness. Of course you can. If you're a Muslim, can you turn to God for forgiveness and get forgiveness? Of course you can. Of course you can. Right? Um Christians would say, can you turn to God and get forgiveness? Of course you can. But Judaism doesn't say that like, you know, people, I want to be very careful with my choice of words here. Jews and Muslims don't teach that forgiveness is somehow mediated or enabled or somehow effectuated or actualized through the death and resurrection of Jesus or Moses or Muhammad or anybody else, right? Uh, it, it's, it, Jews don't teach that Jews get forgiveness somehow because Moses dies and comes back from the dead or Abraham dies and comes back from the dead or um, Jesus dies or comes... No, nothing like that. And the same in Islam. It doesn't work like that. And you could start asking all kinds of questions right now. What does that even mean? I mean, Christians talk about this all the time. Jesus died and rose from the dead and somehow that helps get forgiveness from sins. Well, why? Why do we need someone to die and rise from the dead? to get forgiveness. Like, how does that work? And actually, it turns out, you ask a lot of Christians about this and they really can't explain it. And it turns out that there's actually different views on it. So some Christians, you ask them about it and they'll just be stumped. They don't know what to say. Others will give you an answer, but different Christians give you different answers. I am not going to get into all that right now. I want to make another video where I go into the different theories about that. But for now, one thing we need to understand is, is this, is that all of these early Christians seem to be convinced that Jesus, whether he's God and only God, human and only human, a God man, a super angel, whatever, they are all convinced that God is saving humanity in the person of Jesus. It's not just that Jesus is restoring sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf and life to the dead. It's not just that he's, you know, helping people get food and things like this, which he does a lot of, but that he's actually somehow like freeing people from sin and reconciling people with God and somehow like solving the problem of like human brokenness and all the rest of it, right? So if they believe that, that's obviously a pretty big deal. So the, so these are things that they all agree on. And why do they agree on it? Well, because the New Testament says that Jesus is doing all this. And the apostles are saying that Jesus did it. And maybe Jesus himself is saying that he's doing this, right? And, and a lot of people maybe take those miracles as some kind of evidence that this is true. So there's a, So what binds together these orthodox and heterodox, like, the real Christians and the heretics, the non-heretics and the heretics, they all believe this Jesus guy is really, really special. Um, even the ones who think he's just a human being, they still think he's somehow saving the entire human race. And by the way, that can sound really strange. If he's just a human, how does he save the whole human race? Well, some of these people said he's the only human who didn't sin at all. And then other people said, oh, wait a second, if he's just a human being, how did this guy end up being the only one who never sinned? That's not even possible, right? So anyhow, um, and so what happens in the early church is you actually get a lot of debates. You get a lot of, you get a lot of debates on, on this Jesus guy. Is he God and only God, um, man and only man, but he gets elevated to some special savior role because he never sinned or something like that? Is he God, man, both super angel, what? And these were really big debates in the early church, right? And it actually seems, it's, it's not that we have this linear development where people start off with the only man view and then they go to like the God man view and then they go to the only God view and then they go back to the God man view. This is this sort of linear model I was alluding to a bit ago that a couple of decades ago, a lot of scholars had this idea in their head. It must have been this linear model. You know, it must have been that at first everyone thought he was just a guy, just a good guy, just a man. And then they then they thought, well, no, now we, no, he's too good. He's got to be a God man. And then someone said, no, 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 it's even better. He's, he's just God. And then they like go back to God, man. No, no, no. We have some pretty solid evidence that from basically the beginning, there were, there were all of these different views. 
it's it's not linear development. It's more like a shrub being pruned. We start off with a bunch of different views, and then actually a lot of these views start to fade away pretty quickly. And why do they fade away? Why which which views fade away pretty quickly, and why do they fade away? Well, take the view that Jesus is only God. That fades away pretty quickly. Why? Because. Matthew and Luke tell us that Jesus was born. Holograms aren't born, right? Also, uh, the Gospels tell us about Jesus eating. He seems to go to the bathroom. He gets tired. He sweats. Uh, you know, Luke actually says he sweats blood uh, in the garden uh, before his execution because he really, really doesn't want to be crucified. Who would? And, well, and, and he's suffering pain on the cross and he dies. Well, he can't be a hologram. Holograms don't, like, do that. So, in other words, if you just follow the, you know, the, the New Testament at all, and like the oral traditions at all, and the stories about Jesus that are circulating among the apostles at all, in the early churches at all, it seems clear pretty quickly he can't just be a hologram. So that view kind of fades. But the fact that that view existed in the first place kind of shows you how powerful Jesus is in the imagination of a lot of these early Jews that are willing to say he's, he's not even human at all. He's just God on earth, right? In some kind of hologram or something. Well, what about the view that Jesus is just a human being? That view doesn't last very long either. Why not? Well, because the New Testament tells us that actually Jesus created the whole universe. And you say, well, wait a second. Genesis says God created the universe. Exactly. The New Testament says Jesus created the universe. Exactly. If you think Jesus is God, this is not a problem, right? If you think he's just a man, there's no way he created the universe. Um, Matthew and Luke also say he was, you know, that Mary was a virgin when she conceived him. Then he's not just a normal human being. And a lot of people also said, look, if he's raising the dead left and right and all of this stuff, he can't just be a normal human being. And a lot of people thought this idea that um, Jesus was just a normal human being and just never sinned, is just that just doesn't work. All humans are messed up. So, and what you see here is that actually we've got a lot of evidence in the New Testament that seems to say Jesus is a man. And we got a lot of evidence that seems to say he's God. And actually, I think you can, if you read the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John seems to just say pretty clearly in the first few lines, Jesus is God. And again, there's lots of other passages in the Gospels and in Paul where um, the text seem to seem pretty clearly Jesus is God, but he's also a man. Well, God, man, you can kind of, you can kind of see how you can see how the Jesus was born just a normal human, that disappears, why that disappears. Jesus is only God, that disappears. You can see why the God-man view sticks around. I mean, it's in the texts, right? And it seems like a lot of early Christians seem to have these really powerful experiences in prayer. A lot of early Christians believe they're still performing all these miracles in the name of Jesus. They kind of experience Jesus as God. Um, there's actually an historian today He's still alive named Larry Hurtado. I don't know if he's a Christian or not. And he, he's written a couple of books now trying to figure out why did so many early Christians think Jesus is God? There are Christian scholars and non-Christian scholars, atheist scholars, who are trying to figure out why, you know, the Jews at this time, they didn't say Peter was God. They didn't say Paul was God. They didn't say that the great rabbis of the Talmud were God. Why did they say Jesus was God? And the miracles seem to have something to do with it, though that doesn't seem to be enough. I mean, there's people who perform miracles in the Old Testament. No one accused them of being God. Um, what a lot of scholars now seem to think is that people, they had these like experiences like they had of God when they're praying to Jesus. And maybe a lot of people, they just kind of felt that way when they met Jesus when he was around. I don't know. Anyhow, there it is. So... The Orthodox are the people who say Orthodox smallo, Trinity incarnation. The non-Orthodox, the heterodox, the heretics, they're the ones who say, no, 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 no Trinity, no incarnation. Jesus is only God, not man. He's only man, not God. He's a super angel, dot, dot, dot. Most of these quote unquote heresies end up disappearing before too long. Because again, a lot of them just don't seem to fit the testimony of the New Testament at all. They don't seem to um, 
you know, fit with their hearing and their churches, dot, dot, dot. They don't quite all disappear though, uh, right away. And one that actually has a lot of staying power and that is still around in the, in the Christian world today in some corners of it is what we could call Arianism. We're not talking Arianism like the Aryan race, right? And Hitler and all that. We're talking about, it's different. That's spell, I'll, I'll, I'll spell this stuff out in the description on YouTube. You'll be able to see it. We're talking about Arianism uh, named after this guy, Arius, who was from Alexandria, a city in Egypt. And I think he was like a presbyter or something like that. He was like some kind of elder or something like that in, uh, in, uh, from Christian Egypt, right? And Arius had this view that Jesus is not God. What is he then? That he's some kind of like super angel. He's like the first thing that God creates. Um, so he's not God. God makes him. If, if God makes him, then he's not God. God doesn't make himself, right? So the idea here is like Jesus is like the first thing God makes. He's like this super angel, incredibly powerful. And he does come to earth and he does heal people and he does save the human race from sin and all of this stuff. But he's not God. He's not really a human. He's like this super angel type creature. This view actually has a lot of staying power. There are still some Protestant groups today that believe something like this. And I just want to talk about this for a little bit. You might wonder how, well, okay, does that view really fit the New Testament? Well, some Christians say it does. Um, other Christians would say it doesn't. Um, personally, I don't think it does, or actually I would be an Aryan, right? Um, but I, I do want to say that you can, you can kind of see a little bit where the Aryans were coming from. I've been talking about this so far as if the New Testament and only the New Testament settled this issue of the identity of Jesus. But it's more complicated than that. And just to, just to cause a little bit of trouble for uh, the Orthodox, small O, for my people, just to cause us a little trouble, uh, you know, this, these kind of Christian teachings can seem pretty weird to a lot of people. And I think they did seem pretty weird, even to a lot of early Christians. Go back to this idea that Jesus dies on the cross and rises from the dead, right? If Jesus is God, how does God die? And if Jesus is crucified, then he's suffering. How does God suffer? How does God suffer? How does God die? Now, if you think that Jesus is God, man, you might think that you, you, you appeal to the humanity of Jesus to explain these things. It's like he suffers in his humanity. He dies in his humanity. But it seemed really strange to a lot of early Christians, right? You could also say if if Jesus is God and man, how's that even possible? Could God become a Coke can? You know, could God become my bear's hat? Maybe not. Could God become an ant? Maybe he can't. Is there something, you know, does that mean there's something God can't do? Let's not worry about that. But you might just think, no, 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 I don't think, you know, you might think either God can't do these things or God wouldn't do these things. It's somehow like incommensurate with the glory of God, you know, the greatness of God, that God would become just a human being. Now, the Trinitarian folks, the incarnation folks, they often seize on this as, a, as an example of the humility of God and the nature of love and self-emptying, which is a term that Paul uses and, 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 and et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of other Christians said, no, that, I, it sounds nice, but come on, this can't happen. Like God can't become a human, or if he could, he wouldn't. And God can't suffer and God can't die. Like a lot of people just thought philosophically, theologically, this can't make sense. And whenever we come to our religious texts, however much we might want to check all of our scientific and philosophical views, we, we bring them to the text. Now, texts like the Bible and the Quran, the Talmud can shape the way we understand philosophy and science, but we're bringing these things to the text. And a lot of, uh, I think a lot of these Aryans, uh, they agreed that Jesus did all these wonderful things, healed people, raised people from the dead, and somehow saved the human race but they just couldn't get their mind around how God could be a human and suffer and, and die and, and, and all this. So there's, there's some theology behind this too. There's some philosophical theology. It's not just passages out of the, out of the Bible, right? 
though, again, I, I, I don't want to hammer this too hard, but I, I do think there are quite a few passages in the New Testament that are pretty explicit. Jesus is God. Well, anyhow, there it is. So what ends up happening in early Christianity is that you have a, a lot of folks uh, when Christianity finally starts spreading more and more. You have a lot of folks that have this view that Jesus is God, man, Trinity, incarnation, Trinity, incarnation, Trinity, incarnation, orthodox, small o. And they're appealing to the Bible and the oral traditions that have been passed on and their experience in prayer and worship and you name it. And there are other Christians who say, no, they're not trying to make trouble. They're not trying to cause a problem. They say, no, we're the real Christians. We're the ones who really got it right. And they're looking at the Bible too, and they're bringing in their own philosophical views and their own experiences. And that's how it goes. And again, a lot of these her these so-called heretical groups, heterodox groups, they end up just sort of losing the argument because the, they just seem to be contradicted by the Bible, confuted by the Bible. But this Arian, uh, you know, quote unquote heresy, it's got a lot of staying power. It's got quite a bit of staying power. And you get into, and actually there's some points even in the, in the 300s where the Arians are maybe actually more numerous and powerful than the Trinitarians and the Incarnationists, right? And um, so th wh what happens then? What happens? Well, we talked about our, our, our friend Constantine. Um, our friend Constantine who legalized Christianity. Now, again, he did not mandate Christianity. He didn't say you have to be a Christian. He said you're allowed to be a Christian. You can be a Christian without being tortured, killed, having your property confiscated. You're not going to have to go fight a lion in a coliseum with a stick. You know, like, we'll, we'll allow you to be a Christian without killing you or robbing you. And again, that's 313, the Edict of Milan. Constantine did that. Another thing Constantine did is he convened what is called the First Ecumenical Council. Ecumenical basically means worldwide. Uh, the, the Ecumenical Council was a, a basically a meeting of bishops. Bishops being kind of the main Christian authority in major cities around the Christian world. They, they had this, this great teaching authority. They would um, ordain the priests. They were um, often selected from among the priests. They're... Um, they're like the great teaching authority in the early church. The Pope kind of takes a little bit to actually come on board. Um, the ecumenical council is, is this meeting of bishops, like the great teaching authorities from around the Christian world. Western Europe, Eastern Europe, North Africa, you know, you got it. And there are a number of these ecumenical councils where these bishops gather in the early church. The first one is at Nicaea which is in modern day Turkey, because we talked about actually a number of these are in Turkey, because like we talked about last time, um, Turkey was part of the Roman Empire. Uh, it was a Christian land for a long, long time before the Ottoman Turks conquered it. Um, the first of these councils is in Nicaea in Turkey in the year 325. And the emperor Constantine uh, encourages this council. And why does he do that? Well, the council is supposed to resolve a number of disputes among early Christians, but one of the big disputes it's supposed to resolve is this dispute between the Trinitarian slash Incarnationist folks and the Arians, because these Christians are bickering about this and sometimes there's violence over it. And it constant, it's not clear how devout Constantine really was or how much he really understood or cared about this, even though in my church he's regarded as a saint. Um, I, I think maybe the Catholics also regard him as a saint, and his mama, St. Helen, is regarded as a great saint by Catholics and Orthodox. But Constantine just, you know, he's the emperor, and he doesn't want this main religious group having these factions and infighting. He kind of wants these people to play nice and straighten it out. So he encourages, he encourages them to have this council. And these bishops come from all over the Christian world. And basically, they agree, Arius is wrong, Jesus is God and man, and that's the end of it. And these bishops basically, almost all of them agree that uh, Jesus is God-man, 
And this is one of the major results of the Council of Nicaea in 325. Now, that's the outcome of the council. That doesn't mean that this is binding on everybody legally in any sense at all. And actually, after that council, the Arians acquire more power and more influence. And you have more um, Christian persecutions, uh, persecution of all Christians by the pagans. And among the Christians, the Arians, you know, like, uh, are maybe, you know, have more power. And then you get a second one of these ecumenical councils. This one is at Constantinople. It's in the year 380 or 381, or maybe it goes from 380 to 381. I always forget. It's um, held under Emperor Theodosius I. And this council, all the bishops come and they declare that Jesus is God and man. They do this again. And after this council, Theodosius, who understands the issues and very much believes in the Trinity and very much believes in the incarnation, he, as I mentioned in the last video, he mandates legally, you've got to believe this. You've got to be a Christian and you've got to be this kind of Christian. And this does actually help this view win. It's not like the Arians disappear overnight. Um, you know, there are some pretty large parts of the Christian world that where, where Arianism actually persists for a very, very long time. Um, but, you know, or probably I would guess by at least around the year 1000, you know, Christians from like Ireland, you know, to... Uh, yeah, you know, all of Western Europe and through good parts of Eastern Europe and, and through most of the Christian world, they believe this. They believe the Trinity and the two natures of Christ, right? So there you go. And you get more ecumenical councils. And by the way, if you're Catholic, you have probably heard of something called the Nicene Creed. Uh, you Catholics recite it every Sunday. If you are an Orthodox Christian, Eastern Orthodox, you recite it every Sunday. Um, Protestants, I've been in a lot of Protestant churches, my friends. I have not heard the Nicene Creed recited very often, except in Anglican churches. But a lot of Protestant churches will recite something called the Apostles' Creed, which is pretty close. It's not exactly the same. But if you read the Nicene Creed, Google it, you could read it. It's really interesting document. It starts off by talking about we believe, and I mean, I, 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 I've heard, I've memorized so many versions of this, I get them all run together in my head when I recite them out loud now. But it starts off by saying, like, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. It starts off saying, we believe in one God. Then it says, and in Jesus, who is one in being, consubstantial, um, Homoousion, like one in being, like, you know, uh, whatever it is in, in Greek, uh, one in being with the Father, is basically the Nicene Creed is saying Jesus is God, but different than the Father. He's God, but not the Father. And he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary. And by the way, Catholics bow their head in church at that part. Orthodox don't, Catholics do. They bow their head at that. Became incarnate of the Holy Spirit by the Virgin Mary. Catholics bow their head. He's God and man. God and man. God and man. And the, tr and, and the Holy Spirit is God, but not the Father, not the Son. I mean, it, it's not spelled out totally explicitly, but basically the Trinity is in the Nicene Creed. And the Catholics recite it every Sunday, and the Eastern Orthodox recite it every Sunday, and some Protestants recite it here and there, and other Protestants recite the Apostles' Creed, which doesn't quite have the full Nicene Creed, but, you know, it's got pieces of it. And, okay, what are we saying right now? Small, again, small Orthodox Christians, or small O, small O Orthodox Christians, Trinity, incarnation slash two natures of Christ rooted in the Bible though some Christians would contest that um, rooted in the preaching of the apostles uh, validated by these councils right believed by most Christians today believed by the Catholics believed by the Eastern Orthodox believed by most Protestants by the way how should we describe these Christians that are at these councils are they Catholics no are they Eastern Orthodox? No, there is no Catholic. There is no Eastern Orthodox. We don't get Catholics and Eastern Orthodox until the early 1200s. Nicaea is in 325. Constantinople, first Constantinople is in 380. There aren't Catholics or Orthodox yet. Um, 
It's true that at Nicaea, almost all the bishops are Eastern bishops where the Orthodox will come from, the big O Orthodox will come from, right? But there aren't Catholics or Orthodox yet. There's just kind of the Orthodox versus the heretics. There's whatever. There's the Trinitarians versus the, An the Arians. That's what we're talking about. But these Christians, we do historically end up, you know, we, can, we, we often think of them as the Christians that become the Catholics and the Christians that become the Orthodox. Except a lot of Protestants, most Protestants end up accepting the Nicene Creed. They end up accepting uh, the Apostles' Creed, right? How do I want to proceed with this? We've talked a little bit about Christological debates. We've talked a bit about the ecumenical councils. We've talked a bit about the emergence of orthodoxy, small o. What we want to do now, and I'm 45 minutes in, what we want to do now is talk about, so what exactly do the, the big O orthodox and the Catholics and, and Protestants all share in common, and what do they not share in common? So actually, let me stop this video and I'll start another one, part three, and we'll get into that.